Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. This is video 69 where we talk about the data interpreter in x Forensics and hopefully we'll give you some foundation knowledge to help you understand what's shown in the data interpreter and how best to use it. Before we go into the ins and outs of the specifics of the data interpreter itself uh, within x Forensics of course, um, it's uh, probably a good idea to start with some fundamentals of um, the whole bits and bytes. So this won't get too in-depth, um, but it should be enough to help you understand. Uh, and quoting uh, uh, Jens Kirshner there, where he always said to me once uh, when I was asking him about particular problems, he always just said, just start from zero. So so the fundamental concept of this is obviously bits and bytes and how they're put together to form a data value, whatever that value may be, whether it be a number, a character, whatever. So at the smallest level, you obviously have binary values which are structured in blocks of eight bits, also known as a byte. So an eight bit number uh, is commonly combined with other uh, eight bit numbers to, to form um, larger and larger scales of, of values up to commonly 64 bits, um, which are obviously associated a lot with the naming conventions of operating systems. So if you have four eight bit numbers, so that is, four bytes and each byte having the capability of storing eight bits. Um, you have a 32-bit number, which is commonly used. You can combine more and more of these. And if you have two eight-bit numbers, that's a 16-bit, uh, which was common for computing in the 80s and 90s, and as was 32-bit. 24-bit uh, is used quite a bit for things like certain picture files, color encodings, and things like that and 64-bit is used for all kinds of things uh, but including things like date and time attributes um, and can obviously help you store enormous numbers which we'll come on to shortly. At the very very basic foundation level is the concept of the binary number. So the numbers at the top are what the value of the bit can be if it's flipped from 0 to 1 and the numbers at the bottom are either a 0 or 1. So at the right hand side, bottom row, we have one as opposed to zero, which means it's the, the, the numeric value of one in correlation with the row up above. We flip to the next one. If we make one a zero and we make two the one, then we have the value of two. And then three is the combination of both those top row values together with one one written at the bottom. And then obviously we've now exhausted uh, the one and the two. So we move up to the four where that is represented as one and the rest are all zeros and so on for five and so on for six. And then again, we've exhausted that row now at seven. So we flip over to, to trigger the eighth. Um, so now it's one, zero, zero, zero. And so on for nine, so on for 10 and round and round we go until it flips again and again and you can go up like that until all of the values are one so this binary number is one 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 which is the maximum value that the 8-bit structure can have of 255 which is obviously the addition of all of those numbers at the top 1 to 8 plus 64 plus 32 plus 16 plus 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1. If you have the maximum value of 255 essentially 256 if you count in the zero that that is why a lot of uh, structures and obviously uh, byte representations can't be any higher than 255 and that's why the IP4 address system has a a maximum combination of four octets, each having a maximum value of 255, which is essentially a 32-bit number. It has a maximum addressable range of four, basically four billion, a little over four billion, and that is also known as the IP version four limitation, which was hit many years ago now, which was why things like NAT addressing was invented and, and stuff like that, because there were too many devices for them each to have their own individual IP address. Then we get into the realms of signed and unsigned numbers. So an unsigned number is one that only goes from zero upwards, i.e. in the positive direction. So in the case of a four byte value, you can essentially go up to four billion in the positive direction. So if it's a signed value, four bytes can allow a negative and a positive range 
from negative 2 billion to positive 2 billion. So a signed integer has a minimum value of negative 2 billion and a maximum value of positive 2 billion. An unsigned one, on the other hand, can only go from zero upwards. This is important in programming and things because if you uh, write a function or something that you expect to return negative one if it's false or unsuccessful, then you can't assign that to an unsigned integer. Uh, if you did, you'd get some kind of horrible error message. And so when it comes to number sizes and limitations, one interesting one is that the, uh, the date and time epoch stamp that's used for uh, programming functions to calculate the number of seconds from 1970 is going to run out of values in 2038 on that day any programs that haven't been updated to account for that will start to wobble a little bit and so as we move into the data interpreter demonstration this foundation knowledge in bits and bytes will help you understand better how those values are represented and how they come about and just a very simple example here if you position your mouse pointer and you look at the data interpreter and you're only looking for the specific byte, then the uh, the conversion or the value that you see in the data interpreter may, for example, represent an IP address at octet. Or you might be looking at a Unicode character, uh, which typically is, is two bytes, but can also actually be three or four, depending on the operating system. If you've got a three byte value that you're looking at, could be something to do with things like color encodings in TIFFs. If you're looking at a four byte region, you could be looking at 32 bit date and timestamp. And if you're looking at an eight byte region, it's possibly could be a Windows date and timestamp. So now that I've shown you that basic foundation to uh, bits and bytes, we'll move over to an actual demonstration of the data interpreter within XOS Forensics. Okay, so now we're in Xways Forensics, and obviously I've got some data added. If it's the first time you've launched Xways Forensics, or if you've never used the data interpreter before, you may, firstly, you may or may not actually see it. So this is the data interpreter here, which you'll see is a floating window. If you can't see it, go to View, Show, and ensure that data interpreter is ticked. If it's unticked, then you won't see it. And when you tick it, it will appear somewhere on your screen. Uh, very often it's down the bottom right by default. And by default, it comes with three particular values shown. In order to do lots of more in-depth things, for example, if you want to look at date and time attributes at the hexadecimal level and have them converted or binary values, uh, like we've discussed in the presentation, you need to add some options to this data interpreter. And to do that, you go to options data interpreter. And in here, you will see a whole myriad of other options, which you can enable simply by ticking them. So for example, if you're a, a programmer, for example, you might need to have unsigned and signed value shown of various lengths. You may want a Windows file time stamp, a 64 bit value showing eight bytes, remember and you might want IP address structures to be shown, and you might want binary values to be shown. So if I click OK to that now, you will now see that it auto populates with values. Now the important point to stress is that the data interpreter interprets data from wherever you are clicked within this hexadecimal view. So the byte that you've selected, the data interpreter will then read a number of bytes to the left or to the right, depending on the value and the architecture and the Indianness, which I'm not going to go into today. But it will read a number of bytes, either from left or right, and where possible, interpret those as to valid values that correspond to the data interpreter. So, for example, if I click here, what it will do is it will look at that individual byte as a single value, which you can see here is the 8-bit value that it's showing for that one particular byte. But then because I've now enabled some additional options, it will read a number of bytes from that offset and try and convert them into a valid into a value. So in the case of 64-bit Windows file time stamps, they are obviously eight bits from where you're selected. So it's reading those bytes all in sequence and then doing the mathematics around it and converting it to a timestamp 
which as you can see here is the 3rd of May 2004 and as you can see is shown in Expose Forensics itself up there. Now obviously Expose Forensics will apply various uh, time zone offsets and things like that but on disk in the UTC structure that is the value, uh, the date and time value from where we are selected. Bear in mind it is here where it says 5e. If I move one byte forward it's now trying to read eight bytes from there in order to show you the Windows file timestamp, which it obviously can't do from there because those eight bytes are not a valid date and timestamp. If we go back there, it will now show it to you again. Notice also that it's showing you the binary value here because obviously each byte is eight bits. So that's how it's working that out. In order to show an IP structure, if I go over to my RAM dump here, where there are some TCP IP packets, you will see this obviously isn't as legible as what the MFT record is, which Expo Forensics very helpfully segments for you. In here, we have uh, somewhat of a marker, and then we have MAC address data before it over here. And if I count 14 bytes upwards from here to there, that is the start of one IP address value the source IP address and the the uh, and that will be for four bytes so from there to there is an IP address starting from here so it's counting one two three four and it's separating each byte into the octet and and doing that literal conversion from the binary in which it's stored to the IP address up here and then you have the following four bytes, the destination IP address. The IP address is 18747739. So although it's not showing you the ASCII representation of the byte of the IP address, because in a TCP IP packet it isn't stored like that, it's stored in binary, that is how the data interpreter is successfully showing you the IP address based on wherever you're selecting. And the same is true for every other value you may choose to show in this data interpreter. From wherever you click, it will take that single value if you want just a single value of, of one byte, or if you're trying to do some other uh, mathematics around it, it will read a corresponding number of bytes either to the left or to the right and attempt to show you them in the data interpreter. Um, and as far as I'm aware, that's how all data interpreters work. Equus Forensics isn't the only tool to have a data interpreter. There's a great hex editor in Linux, for example, called WX hex editor and it too has a data interpreter not as feature rich as the one in xways forensics but it has one nevertheless okay i hope that was a useful demonstration for everyone and i'll see you in the next video bye bye